Hello, everybody. Welcome. How you guys doing? <laughs> Just getting the mic set. All good? Good? Okay. Today we have Siddle and Zanelle with Unlocking in Efficiency Python Powered DOI Creation. Okay, I'm handing it over to you guys. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our presentation. And thank you for actually attending. Zanele and I will be giving a talk on how to unlock efficiency by using Python to create DOIs. So a DOI is a digital object identifier, which is tagged to scientific um, papers that our organization uh, produces. And the reason we do that is because we want our scientific papers that are produced by the organization to be persistent on the internet such that it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable by the general public. Um, my name is Siddle. As I have said, I am from the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, and I am a software developer in the software team. Over to you, Zanele. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Zanele Kukuma. I'm also a software developer from South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. Um, the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, also known as Sarao Telescope. Um, Sarao is funded by the NRF. And the mission, our mission as an organization is to collect data um, using Meerkat Telescope. And just a little background on Meerkat Telescope. It consists of 64 antennas that are used to collect data to image the universe. So we collect this data using a Meerkat Telescope for astronomers to analyze and help us understand the universe better. And they do this by publishing scientific papers with their findings. And we couldn't bring everyone here, but we wanted you to meet our team. Um, so as an organization, we have different um, teams, uh, sorry, we have different departments. We have operations, engineering, and so forth. And then we have the software team. And this image is um, everyone in the software team that was taken this year on a social gathering. Um, and then the, uh, the responsibility or objectives as an organization is to control, monitor, and support the Meerkat Telescope. And then um, as a software team, we have different subsystems, and we are part of the pixels. And as the pixels, our responsibility is to create different applications to link the users with the telescope data. We have several applications that we've developed, one being um, OPT, that is observation planning tool, and that is used by astronomers to plan and schedule um, observations. And then we have one which is called digital repository, and we use the digital repository to, to store digital assets. And by digital assets, um, I mean the papers that are um, published by our sorry, by, by our astronomers, as well as other telescope products. And then all these digital assets are then assigned a digital object identifier, DOI. Um, and then a DOI is an alphanumeric string that is used to, to locate an object persistently. And then this is how a DOI would look like. It has a resolver as well as a prefix, and that we get from the registration agency. That's more of a, a directory or a folder where um, Sarawo DOIs would be stored. And then in, in blue, we have the suffix, which is received from the client. So each time we create a DOI or assigning a digital asset um, with a DOI, that's a string that we get to identify that uh, particular um, DOI. And then we use this method because uh, by design, sorry, um, we use this method because by design, a DOI um, never changes. 
unlike using a normal URL where um, if the, the, the location of the data of the data asset changes, then it would be difficult to actually locate that um, that um, asset. And then the registration of our choice is data site. We use um, data site to create or mint DOIs. Um, so we, we actually have mandatory fields to create a DOI, and that is a title, an author, abstract, as well as data location. And then here we have a screenshot of how data site commons uh, look like. So currently we have 18 uh, public DOIs, and what this means is that these are um, available on the internet. This one is um, titled Beam Former Coherency Commissioning Test in 1K Mode at L Band. It has its authors, um, the, the year that it was published, and then here marked in orange is the actual DOI that is assigned to this data set. Um, and then you can do a few things. You can filter um, by authors by or year, as well as the data set. And now I'm going to take you through how we normally create DOIs manually. And then Siddle will take you through how we are improving um, the program, the process. So we, I pre-recorded um, because sometimes demo gods are not with us and things go wrong. <laughs> okay, let's watch again. We have the, the prefix here, which is the directory where the raw DOIs are stored. And then when I click the button, um, the suffix was then created to identify this DOI that I'm creating. Um, the first date when creating a DOI would be um, the draft, which will only be visible on Fabrica um, and can be deleted. And then here we have the location where, of the landing page with the information of the, the resource or, or the digital asset you are trying to um, create to iPhone. And then uh, we have created
Okay, thank you. So that was the manual process. Now I'm gonna give to Siddle to finish off the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Zanele, for taking us through the manual process of how to create a DOI to attach to a digital asset. So now, can you imagine if we were to increase the number of authors in a paper? The amount of time that you took to create one DOI was approximately like three minutes, which was inputting the author manually. So now if we have a hundred, it will take much more time to create this, this DOI. So now um, we got into a dimension of problems where we are saying that this is so tedious for you to input authors, especially if it's 100 authors, and it is more prone to errors as we are humans and you might make a mistake, and it's also time consuming. We actually had a case study where a developer, okay, we actually had a case study where a developer had um, half a day to input 100 authors when they were creating a DOI. And that is time that could be used for other stuff like developing or any other productive work. So now we had to get into a, a, a dimension where we are saying what could be the solution of eradicating the time consumption that it takes to create a DOI. So then we thought of Python because it's, it's simple as well as adaptable. So we thought, how about we create a Python script to automate this process? Automate the process of generating a DOI using a few commands. And um, in using Python, there's a lot of libraries that could be used with Python to create different tasks. In this different task, it, it's, it depends on what you want to do for you to, to select a library. The library that we used mostly in this code, we used uh, the request library. And what the request library does is it's a protocol that allows communication between a client um, and a server. So on the client, you would send a request to the server. The server processes the request and then gives a response to the client. So um, in using this library, we have created a Python class. And in this class, we expect metadata. So what the, the inputs that Zanelli was putting manually, such as the authors, would be, would be, we would get it via a YAML file where somebody who has already written all the, all the, all the list of authors, even if they are 100, the, the data location, as well as the abstract. And with that information, we can now create a DOI manually, I mean, automatically, update it if there's any update that needs to be done, register it, meaning that we are regist registering it with data side, and then make it findable, findable to the public to access it. And then in case there's any problems with the DOI, we can take it into a hide state where now the public won't see it, but only the creators can see it. And then if you want information on the DOI, you can get the, the information, as well as delete a DOI. The DOI can only be deleted if it's in this draft state. Once it gets into the registered state, as well as the findable state, it cannot be deleted. Here is a snippet of the Python code. I didn't want to bore you with a lot of code, but I just wanted to show you the simplicity of having a, a Python uh, class. And this is one the name of the class is called DOIs, and this is one method that we have of creating DOIs. It consists of, a, of um, less than 10 lines of code. So the workflow is that we, we are also on the side creating a Sarawa repository, which is still under construction. So what would happen is that you go on the Sarawa repository, fill in a form with the metadata to say, oh, these are the list of authors, this are that and that and that. And then from there, we convert the information that you, you gave us via the form into a YAML file. Once we, we convert it into a YAML file, we then use that YAML fi file to run a script. And then with the script, we can either perform, um, there's different functionalities that we can perform. We can create a DOI for you if you want it updated, if you want to hide it, make it findable. All of the functionalities can be done. And then you can go to data side and check if your DOI is created or updated or whatever state that you wanted to, to be in. So I'll give a demo also on how we do this uh, automatically.
I will now take you through how to make a DOI automatically uh, using a Python script. So now we are on Data Site Fabrica. Shown uh, the 46th DOI was created manually, where we have two authors, Zanele and Siddle. So now on the left hand side, we have an IPython environment, and I'll show you how to run a few commands to create or generate a DOI automatically. So now, as she has shown, um, she has shown only using two authors. We have created a YAML file which collects the metadata, and the metadata involves a list of authors, and I think the authors are probably 20 authors, so it's a little bit more um, authors than what she had uh, illustrated. And then what we have also done is we have packaged the class for creating DOIs, and we called it DOIs. And here I just imported, so now I have the functionality, I can access the functionalities of DOIs. And first things first, what we need to do is to instantiate the, the DOIs class. And I do that by giving it the data file, YAML file, which is the metadata, with the list of authors, title, abstract, and everything, and uh, a user details, which involves or which contains the username as well as the password. And then from there, we can use the different um, methods of this class. The first method that I would want to show or illustrate is creating a DOI. And uh, we have created a DOI as it is shown in this section here. A DOI with that alphanumeric string was created. And I will refresh to get to see if it has updated. As we wait for it to refresh. So it has updated. We had 46 DOIs, but, but by running this few commands, we have the 47th DOI modeling of PKSB. And uh, here's a list of authors that we had given it, approximately 20, and it did that in less than a second. And uh, now we have an alphanumeric string for it. And if you have more than 20 authors, you can still use the same commands to run and create a DOI automatically within seconds. 100, 1,000, doesn't matter the number of authors that you have. So there's also other functionalities that you can do uh, if you are trying to update a DOI. You would have to remember this, this alpha numeric string. So when instantiating, you need to give it that, okay, now I am working with this DOI. And then from there, then you can update. So let's say that you wanted to update, then you would just run an update function. In this case, I didn't change anything, but um, there is an update function where you would update it. And then the metadata that you have updated will then reflect here. But now that I haven't changed anything, it will still be the same. And then now let's say that you want to change from draft state to registered then you would um, run a function or the method called register DOI. So this means that uh, it is now registered with data side. It is in their books. Uh, it has changed from draft to registered. And if we can just refresh, we will see that the state has changed from draft that was in orange to uh, registered, which is in blue. That's just an, a color indication of the different states. Uh, we'll wait for it to refresh quickly. And then it is, now it's registered. And then now we can now say that the author is happy with this DOI and is saying, okay, you can make it public for the, for the public to see this DOI and access it. Then we can now come here and make it findable. So we have registered with the agency, and now the author is happy. We then uh, make it findable uh, by set findable. Excuse me. 
we can actually set it uh, to be findable using this method. And I have run that method. Um, let's see if it can change the state. It has changed the state from registered to findable. And refreshing the page, this section of registered should change to findable, meaning that um, anyone who accesses this URL, this specific URL, will see this um, DOI. So now, uh, let us try to get to Okay, um, that's a demonstration of how we have uh, used Py a Python script to automatically create DOIs, irrespective of the number of authors that are in a paper or the, the amount of um, wording there is in the abstract. So that's not the only thing that you could, you could automate in using Python. The other uh, scripts that we have written are where wants to automatically create a website. Uh, this website that's shown here, the screenshot, was actually um, generated using a Python script. So we wrote a Python script where you give it certain inputs and on, the, on those inputs, then it will create a, a web page because with the DOIs, we want the data to actually show on a web page. The other example of how we have used Python to automate a process was, uh, how we upload our data into the Amazon S3 bucket. So for, for the public to actually download the data that we are trying to release, we put them, we put the data, we put the data on an Amazon bucket and then they access it from there. And this whole data transfer from our self storage to the S3 bucket was created using a Python script. So in conclusion, we have leveraged the of Python automate process and as i've said this is not the only process that you can automate you can think of uh, processes that are manual in the work that you're doing and think of how you would use a script to automate that using python and we have used python simply because it's simple and adaptable so it was easy for us to just adapt it to the problem at hand and also because of its the fact that it's a high level language, meaning that we didn't have to deal with the system specific intri intricacies. We just focused on the problem that we had and how we could solve it. And as I have stated before, that there are many standard libraries that perform different tasks. In our case, we used the, the request library, but there are other libraries that could be used for other, for other tasks. These are some of the references that we have used, and thank you for listening to our talk. Any questions? Thank you so much. Uh, question. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question uh, regarding the. Um, you showed a flow chart about about halfway through the. Yeah, that one. Um, it looks as though you've just moved the form filling in like a few steps earlier. Because you, I mean, you still need to capture those it, the author's names somehow. Like over there, it says you have a a Sereo external form. Is is that easier in some way? Like how does how does that help someone not spend half a day entering a hundred authors? So currently, it, that an author like the, the combination authors the first time that they are writing a paper together but if they have like a big text where they have written a paper previously they can send they can send that through but if it's the first time where they are is, the, is that combination of authors they have to fill in the form and then from there we'll have it elsewhere okay uh, over there another question I, I understand that you're talking about the digital op Just a question. Let's say you have a, a test equipment, right? Yeah. I know that you can just assign an IP address for that. 
and communicate with it, right? I'm seeing, I, I'm aware that you can just assign an IP address to a test equipment and communicate with it, right? Let's say, for instance, can you use this method that you're using here to assign an URL for that test equipment? Is it possible? So that, so that you can access it via the web. Okay, so understanding your question, you're saying that you have an IP address that you want to tag a digital object identifier. I am not quite sure if you can do that, um, but because it's a, a digital object identifier and that IP address is like a digital object, you probably could identify it. You, you could have a URL to access it, but I'm not quite sure if that's possible. Hi, sorry, what is self storage? Self storage is the server where we put our our data. Yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> Here you go, man. <laughs> uh, so yeah, is can you use any any other type of storage when you're dealing with the AWS? Any type of a server, because here you're so specific that you're talking about the self. I think it should be possible to use any type of storage. Um, the reason why we we used the Amazon S3 bucket was that we couldn't make um, like the, the data public for people to access it from our our from surf so we had to put it into s3 so that it's we give them access to download it okay um we just have one last question um online banner asks how does uh dois differ from standard framework routing like in django just uh signing it a uh, standard uh, framework routing like URL pathing. Okay, to answer that, um, with a URL, um, the location can change. So it can be difficult to locate the asset. However, the, the way uh, by design, a, a DOI is intended not to change. So it's pers persistently. Okay, awesome. Um, that's it? Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. Round of applause.